Roommates, to me, were necessary annoyances that helped pay half the rent. I was the roommate who set the vacuum cleaner out in the middle of the floor to let the other person know it was their turn to clean. <laughs> if only everyone could live by my rules, the world would be a better place. Yep, I was that roommate. That vacuum sat out for three straight days until rushing to class one day, I tripped on it and broke my toe. <laughs> <clears throat> After the dorms, my first college roommate was Mary, <clears throat> a psychology student attending university on a full paid scholarship, which I took to mean she studied all the time and would make a good roommate who stayed in her room and didn't bother me. Mary had grown up on a farm in Kansas. She sold her 4-H blue ribbon cow to buy a Camaro to drive to the University of Oklahoma where we met. A farm girl from Kansas who had a pet cow? Responsible, morals, Midwestern work ethics. She had it all for the perfect roommate. We lived together for our sophomore and junior years of college. Our first issue was when she put my iron skillet in the dishwasher. <laughs> You'd think a farm girl would know better. <laughs> Have you ever wanted to see the full effects of oxidation? But Mary and I grew a little restless our junior year. I'd broken up with my loser boyfriend who thought he wanted to be a detective and solve mysteries with a gun. And she'd broken up with her engineering student boyfriend who never left his room or books. I thought M Mary should learn to live a little. So I took her to parties with me. And water skiing on the weekends with some guy I knew who had a boat and a fancy car. She learned to be a party girl and we laughed a lot. Then Mary got a new boyfriend, Michael, who she said she knew from her past. Mary's new boyfriend bought her lots of fancy gifts, like pearl necklaces, which were all the rage in the 80s. When she locked herself out one night and I woke up at 4 a.m. to banging on the front door only to find her standing there in a full-length fox fur coat, I began to wonder. When I came home from class another afternoon and the boyfriend sat at the kitchen table counting stacks of greenbacks that he was stashing in Crown Royal bags, I became concerned. <laughs> when a brand new IROC Z convertible took the place of the 4-H cow Camaro, concern turned into worry. Ruining an iron skillet was annoying enough, but drug dealing was not in any of the rule mate rule books. One day, Mary said she was gonna go meet her guy in Miami, and she'd be gone a few days. While she was gone, her mom called and told me she'd read a notice in the local Kansas paper that Mary had married Michael from their hometown in Kansas. He was an ex-con, and mom was very scared. I became scared too. When Mary returned a few days later and her eye rock was not in the driveway, I found her sitting in her dark room in shock. She had been doing lines of coke in her car, driving overnight to Florida from Oklahoma. When she saw an 18-wheeler changing lanes in front of her, but she thought she could make it around him in time. Her eye rock went under the middle of the trailer between, between the wheels, slicing off the top of her new car. I could have been decapitated, she said, her eyes the size of silver dollars. I suggested she might want to get away from Michael. Clearly, she was the type of person who has to be told when to vacuum, how to clean an iron skillet, and when to quit partying so hard. After an unpaid $400 phone bill, and I found out she'd been taking my rent check to the landlord but not paying her half, I took my vacuum and I moved out. That was the 80s. In 1993, my vacuum and I moved in to what we roommates deemed the healing house. We'd all come from broken relationships and we shared a house not unlike the Brady Bunch house, and we were like Marsha, Jan, and Cindy, only we were Sarah, Carol, and Amy. We all had long, straight blonde hair and thought of ourselves as independent women who sat on the sofa every single night and watched Nick at Night. <laughs> Mostly married Tyler Moore reruns while eating frozen burritos. Sarah had just broken up with her boyfriend who did nothing but smoke pot all day. 
My boyfriend had dumped me, so I did decided to become celibate. <laughs> I'd read in a magazine that if you could be celibate for a whole year, you'd learn to love yourself. <laughs> I didn't make it the year. <laughs> and Carol recently moved in when her real estate developer fiancé dumped her a week before the wedding. All those ordered napkins and liquor were not going to go to waste, so on her intended wedding day, Sarah and I threw her a party. We invited all the women we knew, and we filled that two-story house with raging women and celebrated Carol's new single life. Sarah and I even made her a papier-mâché penis pinata. Celibate, celibate me worked on the head of the penis and decided it should be circumcised. <laughs> Sarah covered two standard balloons with wet newspaper and took a blow dryer to the testicles. We painted it a flesh tone and the pinata was complete with black yarn pubic hair. <laughs> we strung it up by an electrical cord just to show how much power we had over the penis. And since it was the days of Thelma and Louise, we filled it not with candy, but tiny little liquor bottles. <laughs> Our party rocked. Our party rocked hard. And for one day, her intended wedding day, Carol forgot she'd been dumped. And I don't need to tell you how frightened the pizza delivery guy was when he came to our house that night. <laughs> not long after, Carol met someone else. She came home to tell us that she'd been asked out on a date by someone we might be a little surprised to meet. Why, we asked. He's covered in tattoos, she said. Back then, to have a full body tattoo meant you were, you were in the words of my grandmother, a dirty person. <laughs> it wasn't like it is today, where it's as common as piercing your ears. In the 90s, there weren't those cool tattoo parlors on every corner. Hank was his name. He's nicer to me than anyone I've ever met, Carol said. Our hearts soared for her. A nice man, someone who's kind and generous and thoughtful. We loved that. We all wanted that. Body tattoos be damned. He sent her flowers, gave her hand-drawn cards, and took her on picnics on his lunch break from Postal Plus. I never said anything, but as you might imagine, I silently judged her and had an inkling this would come to no good. As expected, she came home one day sad. He had broken his parole. He'd, sm he'd smoked a little pot, he said. And then they had a surprise drug test and he had to go to prison and finish up his sentence. Back to prison? We didn't know he'd been in prison. He was just in for making fake IDs, Carol said. Fraud. He still has two years to serve. Two years? That's a lifetime in the dating world. He could get out early for good behavior again, she said. In the back of my mind, I was disappointed. Carol vacuumed and cleaned up the kitchen after herself. Was this another roommate gone the wrong direction? We sat on the couch each night, watching Nick at night, waiting with Carol for the collect calls to come in from Lompoc Prison. I kept my thoughts to myself, and we wished her well when she went for visits every other weekend. He still sent flowers, which how he ordered them from prison could not be revealed, and he sent her homemade cards elaborately drawn in blue big pen, the same pen used for tattooing because in prison that's how they tattooed. <laughs> we learned a lot of new things about prison. Hank was a great tattoo artist and made a little money on the side in the slammer as the resident tattoo artist. He was considered one of the best until he got caught. Apparently, it's illegal to have a sharp, pointy object to cut the skin deeply while in prison. <laughs> Despite that, Hank did get out earlier for good behavior. Carol explained that he'd been released into her custody. He'd be staying with us. <laughs> Hope that's okay. <laughs> When I woke up one morning and made my way downstairs to get coffee, I was startled to find the exquisitely tattooed ZZ Top band member look-alike sitting at the table in the near-dark kitchen. I made a mental note that I'd have to quit wearing baby doll pajamas and stick to sweatpants. <laughs> Even though he seemed like a nice guy, I doubted that he vacuumed. <laughs> because we were women who supported one another, Sarah and I said it would be okay for him to stay. 
It wasn't permanent, Carol said, just until Hank got back on his feet and the parole board would allow him to live on his own. We didn't ask how long that would be. We just learned some new parts of a parolee's life, like when a call came in each evening from the prison, we were to say he was asleep when really he and Carol were out. <laughs> in my head, I was thinking, not following the rules. <laughs> Over time, we all eventually left the healing house and went our separate ways. Thinking back, it's like watching a rerun of the sitcom of the best years of my youth. I see women supporting one another in all the right and wrong ways. I still have the iron skillet that went through the heavy load cycle in the dishwasher. I think of Mary every time I use it. Skillets can be reseasoned and come back to life. Mary got back on her feet and went to grad school. Hank and Carol got their own apartment. He's doing his art and they live very happily. And when I think of that vacuum in the middle of the room and my broken toe, I don't think of irresponsible roommates. Instead. I'm pretty sure being passive aggressive didn't make me the perfect roommate either, even though I paid my rent on time. Thank you very much. <laughs>